Right. Um, good afternoon uh, from the Eastern Seaboard, and good morning to um, all of you who are in other time zones. Um, my name is Sesha Tekor, and I'm the Technical Sales Specialist for High Content Screening Solutions. And I welcome you all to the Connect to Science um, High Content Screening User Group Week. This is the fourth talk uh, of this uh, series. And with me are my colleagues, uh, Brent Sampson and uh, Dr. Neil Durso. And we as a team support the North American high content product portfolio. Um, our user group meetings have historically been um, for our user and prospect base. And more importantly, these events have largely focused on highlighting some of the excellent work, one of which you'll see today, by our scientists utilizing the high content screening analysis platforms. And I personally hope that this week you will see the value uh, if you've already seen the other three talks, you would have definitely seen the true value and part of the technology. And today's talk is going to highlight that as well. Um, this is going to be for both your needs and workflow. Uh, our user group meetings have always been a great forum to bring all of us together as a community and share the value of uh, Thermo Fisher, Salamix, High Content Solutions across the board. Um, today, to round off this week of high content speakers, I'm proud to introduce a, a good friend of mine, Dr. Michael Johnson. Not many people can gloat about this, but Michael Johnson has been uh, the Forbes 30 under 30 honorary for both 2017 and 2019. Uh, and that's uh, that speaks volumes to begin with. Uh, he's uh, the CEO and co-founder of a company called Visicall Inc. based out of New Jersey. It's a bioimaging company that spun out of Rutgers University, uh, and it started back in 2016. And Michael co-founded this company along with uh, his uh, PhD candidate colleagues, Tom Villiani and uh, Nick Kreider. Um, Michael, uh, to say the least, has a diverse background with experiences both in technical and business considerations um, of uh, basically running biotech business, uh, which is his strong forte. Um, he did his undergrad uh, at uh, Muhlenberg College, and after that, he spent three years in various roles in Johnson & Johnson, where he concurrently pursued his uh, PhD in applied microbiology at Rutgers. Um, his research background has largely focused on a wide range of uh, applications and projects, um, from ranging from remote sensing research with NASA, which is, which is just brilliant, and to building light sheet microscopes and um, producing biofuels as well. So he's got a very diverse background. And prior to launching this call, Michael worked on several other biotech uh, entrepreneurial pursuits and is very passionate about translating uh, cutting edge research into life changing commercial technologies. Um, today, he's going to be talking about uh, multiplexing imaging and analysis of slides using high content imaging. And um, I look forward to that this talk, Michael. Uh, for all the attendees, I believe you'll all, all be in mute during the seminar, but uh, feel free to type in your questions um, on the chat box. There is one right at the bottom right. Uh, the speaker can see these questions and so can the panelists, i.e. Brent and I. Um, so they might be able to, the speaker might be able to respond to these questions almost immediately. But the goal is for us as panelists to kind of collate these questions and bring it up as a Q&A session after the talk. Um, this kind of keeps the flow going. But uh, Michael, please feel free to jump in and answer any questions immediately as uh, you go along. Um, so without further ado, I give you Dr. Johnson. Uh, Michael, the stage is all yours. Excellent. Well, thank you for the uh, introduction. Let me just uh, share my screen here. Cool. Okay, can you get my screen? Yeah, uh, just to, uh, I didn't see Victoria, I didn't see you were in the panel as well. Uh, I, we have Victoria Thane in the panel as well, and she's one of our colleagues uh, from the Western uh, Coast. Plex imaging analysis of slides using high content imaging, but I was also going to focus on some of the other 3D cell culture um, assays and work that we've done 
our company. We've been a user of the CX-7 for a few years now. Um, we absolutely love the instruments. And I would say this, um, it's not a testimonial, I'm not being paid for this, but the machine has been incredibly reliable for us. We're running um, assays every single day. We're running extended time points. Uh, and we need a machine that's very, very reliable. And the CX-7 has fit that bill for us. So we've been very happy with it. I don't think we have had any hardware or software issues and uh, over about three years now. So overall, we're super happy with the uh, the machine and running an imaging business, having a reliable piece of equipment is absolutely everything. So to, uh, to jump into it, just a little bit of background on our company, just so you understand where we're coming from with our feedback here. The focus of our company is transforming tissues into insights. And we do that using uh, imaging and other tools that we've developed, but ultimately we're focused as a contract research organization to help pharma companies address their most challenging uh, drug discovery research questions, uh, looking at PK, looking at tox, looking at safety, uh, looking at efficacy. We're trying to help pharma companies generate terabytes of data and distill that data down into useful insights that allow part of the drug discovery and development process. The company today, we offer services in a couple key areas. Our expertise is imaging, image analysis, and advanced cell culture. So we do 2D and 3D cell culture assays. We do what we call whole mount imaging, which is using tissue clearing and uh, 3D imaging on large tissues, digital path, uh, 3D cell culture assays, and then a bunch of custom image and image analysis projects for clients. Now to dive right into the focus of this talk here um, is immuno-oncology, and then the second focus I'll talk about is NASH. These are two disease areas um, that we do work in a lot, and where 3D cell culture models and advanced imaging tools are particularly helpful for a couple of reasons. So um, in the IO space, cancer cells can escape immunosurveillance by avo avoiding acute inflammation and tumoral activity. They can promote chronic inflammation, which can, can encourage uh, tumor growth. And our objectives of IO are to strengthen or to modify the immune system to target um, these cascades through immunotherapies. And there's two different types of immuno-oncology therapy approaches today. There's passive and there's active. I won't dive into these in a lot of detail here, but the main focus um, of why we're using high content imaging or using different types of multiplex analysis is that there are a lot of different types of immune cell subtypes of players in the immune system space. And we need to image a lot of different types of cells all at the same time, which is where this concept of multiplex um, slide imaging and uh, tissue imaging comes to. And where CX-7 provides a lot of value. One of the common questions that we're looking at in this space is immune cell infiltrations. So we're looking at uh, tumor infiltrating immune cells as it's associated with better prognosis for cancer patients. Typical analysis involves uh, sectioning of tumor samples and processing for IHC to label T cells. Um, but with in vitro assays, we're able to actually monitor them um, in 2D formats using Boyden chambers or assays. And then lastly here, 3D cell culture models, which are a relatively new approach for studying immune cell infiltration, allow us to use a more relevant model to assess how uh, they're actually invading into uh, tumoral cells. So again, a traditional technique for looking at um, immune cells and um, um, immune profiling is using immunohistochemistry. Problem here being we're able to look at one single slice from one single tissue at a time, usually for one or two, so we're not of data um, that we're interested in for many different subtypes of um, immune cells. Multiplexing approaches that are out there um, and available today, there's fluorescence. Um, there's a couple different fluorescence-based approaches for multiplexing and studying this, um, this IO landscape. Um, there's um, the fluorescence approaches are rely upon fluorescent probes tagged to antibodies. There's the, um, the SIF fluorescence bleaching approach. There's co-detection by indexing or fluorescent uh, immunohisto PCR. There's fluorescent tyramide mediated amplification. And then lastly, there's antibody stripping, which is what I'll talk about today um, in this segment on multiplex slide labeling. Technology, which I won't dive into in great detail, but it's a really cool technology, is CYTOF or imaging mass cytometry. Um, this is a way to use uh, mass cytometry to actually create imaging data. It has the ability to generate lots of markers from a single slide, um, but it's very slow. It's uh, quite expensive, um, and you can only image a small area from a slide at a time. So these are the different approaches that we have to studying uh, slides and to um, assess the immune uh, profile of slides that we're looking at. Now, the uh, immune uh, imaging mass cytometry approach, which I just left off there, um, we can image through a blade 
We have metal tag antibodies, and we're able to get about 37 plex imaging from a single slide, but it's a really slow approach for actually acquiring data from uh, slides. But we're able to use it to look at um, immune cells. We're looking at how they into high proliferating areas or areas of interest on our slides. We're able to answer many questions by looking at many different types of cells at the exact same time. And we're able to look at a lot of different labels. I'm just showing three at a time here just because it's, it's tough to show many different labels from a single slide as you run out of colors after three or four colors. But the approach allows us to get a lot of data from a single slide. And we can go up to about 40 markers with imaging mass cytometry. The, uh, the problem with imaging mass cytometry, though, and a lot of the other techniques that are out there for multiplexing are that they are quite expensive. They require proprietary reagents. They require expensive imaging equipment that you don't have in your lab. Or the antibodies that are available are only available for certain targets that you might not be interested in. Technology that we've been working on for a while now is something called EasyPlex, and um, this is an easy-to-use multiplexing approach that's compatible with any um, imager that's out there. And I know the CX-7 is typically um, you know, slated for cell-based assays, but we've put it through the paces for almost every type of application you can think of, from imaging um, large one millimeter thick brain slices to whole mounts of retinas to organoids. Um, and this is just one other example of how we've put the CX-7 to use as a slide scanner. As a slide scanner, it's actually um, relatively comparable to some of the other slide scanners that are out there as far as time goes. Um, we're able to actually image uh, whole slides for multiple channels. So with this um, EasyPlex approach that we've developed, we're able to wash antibodies off of slides. And um, in between panels of four to five uh, labels at a time, um, we wash off and then relabel and re-image. And through this process, we're able to image uh, many labels from a single slide, all using the, uh, the CX-7 LZR that we have in our lab. Um, so just a little more background. We're, um, we're labeling the slide, um, we're imaging, we're removing that, um, that set of uh, labels, we're washing them with uh, new antibodies and new labels, and then re-imaging again. Um, and we're able to show that we can actually uh, remove those antibodies completely. There's no noise left behind. And we're able to get 8, 12, 15 plex from a single slide uh, using our CX-7 in our lab. Uh, so the approach, really simply, just to give an overview of what we're actually doing, is that we're labeling slides with four antibodies plus DAPI. Two to three antibodies uh, are typically conjugated because we have you know, only so many species to work with. Ideally, we're using secondary labeling for only our most expensive antibodies to reduce costs. While multiplex labeling is really cool, it provides you a lot of great data, it is actually pretty expensive per slide, and the main driver of that cost are your primary antibodies. So always looking at ways to reduce that. And if you choose your antibodies appropriately, you can definitely reduce the overall cost of doing multiplex imaging. We then image these slides with our CX-7 LZR using 3D printed uh, slide holders. I know um, uh, Thermo also offers uh, slide holders that um, you can buy as well through them. We 3D print some of our own for custom size slides and um, different formats that we have here. And then we remove the labels with um, EasyPlex reagent that we've developed and we repeat the process of labeling and imaging again and again and again. And on the back end, one of the challenges with multiplex labeling which is a stumbling block for a lot of researchers is co-registration. So you get one panel, um, you relabel re and you re-image with a second panel of labels. And a problem always with imaging is those two panels don't align perfectly. So we at Visicol, we've developed software for co-registration so aligning those two panels with one another using the DAPI channel. So the DAPI channel will be the same uh, between those two slides, and we're able to use that to co-register all the other biomarkers together um, using this elastic co-registration process that we've developed. Um, in the next few weeks, you'll see this coming out. This will be an open source tool that we're giving out for free. So if folks use this approach. Um, it's a tool through ImageJ that anybody can access and freely use, but it's a piece of that allows uh, multi to be adopted by any lab. You won't need special equipment. You won't need special tools. You can use the antibodies you have today. And if you have a CX-7 LZR, you can be up and running with multiplexing right away. You don't need an expensive piece of equipment to get up to speed. So um, be on the lookout for that. That'll be coming out in the next few weeks here. We're launching this reagent and also this um, software in the next few weeks, but it pairs seamlessly with the CX-7 for routine uh, slide scanning and uh, multiplexing, which is really cool. And it really drops the barrier to adoption 
you've seen this all before, but we have two um, image data sets with DAPI. We have panels associated with each DAPI channel quite fit exactly with one another. So we're taking those DAPI channels, we're aligning them with an elastic co-registration approach, and then all of our other channels are going to line up appropriately as well. And then we can actually do our analysis um, after the fact of all the data that we've generated. And one other example, um, this is again, complex panel. We're looking at colon here. We're using our 7LZR for the data generation, but we're getting really good slide scanning uh, from this. You see a little bit of um, piling here, but overall the, the quality of data is fantastic from the CX-7 and uh, relatively fast compared to even uh, slide scanners that are designed to do just slide scanning. So it's a pretty cool tool. I don't think a lot of folks are using high content imagers to do slide scanning, um, but you have the ability to do it and you can do it pretty, easel uh, pretty easily and seamlessly with the CX-7. Um, but why to, why to use multiplexing? We can generate cool data, but what do you actually do with it? Um, when we work with our pharma clients, we're typically looking at a couple different uh, problems. In this case here, this is data generated with a CX-7. Uh, we're doing five labeling of um, a lung tumor and different channels that we're imaging with here. For well, from this data, look at different types of segmentation approaches. We can look at just the tumoral area. We can look at just the uh, stromal area. We can look at how T cells are invading into our tumoral area. And then if the animals are dosed with different kinds of amendments, uh, different treatments, we can see how those different modulations change what's happening with our immune cells and how they're interacting with one another. And we can take this data and, of course, quantify it. So we can look at our CD3 positive cells and our stroma versus our tumor. We can look at um, normalized population of cells by region. So our CD45 positive cells, PD1 positive cells. Where are they? Um, what are they doing? How are they interacting with each other? Um, we can get total count. You can look at every combination of markers you can think of, whether they're in the stroma, whether they're in the tumor area, how close the boundary of the tumor area they are, and we can start to understand how this immune, um, how this immune system is responding to our treatment, how it's responding to disease, and how we can modulate the immune system for the response that we're, we're looking for. And just to show you another um, endpoint example here, a common question that we're asked is how are our T cells infiltrating into our tumoral area? So we can look at all of our individual T cells. We can look at what they're labeling for, whether it's CD3 or CD3 and PD1. Um, and we can see how these different um, our tumoral area, which allows us to better understand what's happening and how we're modulating that immune response. So multiplexing provides us with an enormous amount of data from a single slide. Slides from immuno-oncology studies are precious. They are expensive. We do not have a lot of tissue material. And this approach allows us to generate a huge amount of data. And the process itself is also non-destructive. So we can come back with other assays. We can come back with traditional H&E, IHC afterwards, uh, RNA-C, qPCR, and look for other types of data from these tissues that we've looked at with multiplex uh, slide labeling. So this is a really powerful tool. We're able to answer a whole bunch of questions that traditionally we're not able to answer with uh, standard immunohistochemistry or standard imaging, and we can really dig deep into what's happening with the immune system. And just to show one last example here, um, we can look at um, masks. So using this approach, we can look for a mask of where are T cells, and we can overlay that on top of the data that we're generating, which allows us to have a much clearer picture of what's happening on our slides. And sometimes we'll actually share this data with our pathologist who might be characterizing these slides using a traditional qualitative uh, pathology approach. We can give them this data to amend that, and they can answer more complex questions by adding this data on top of their pre-existing approach for analyzing these slides. So just overall, really Really cool way to generate data. We're able to generate meaningful quantitative data from slides using this approach. Now, the second topic, which um, is also in line with multiplexing, so generating lots of imaging data and lots of channel data from a single um, piece of tissue, or in this case, a 3D cell culture model, is an initiative that we launched a few years ago called Open Liver. In the uh, 3D cell culture space, uh, it's a new space. I mean, at this point, we've probably only gone from academia to industry in about five or six years. And now 3D cell culture models are being used by pharma companies and biotech companies all over the place. But the adoption has been rapid and the field is very new. And we don't yet have standardization like we see in a lot of other fields um, in cell culture. We don't have a case 
standard assays in this space. So something we set out to do is to put out a couple standard 3D cell culture models that researchers could see how they're made, they could see how they're procured, see how they're validated, and really open source them so all researchers have access to them. If you want to learn more about it, you can check out our website. Um, but we colloquially refer to this as our open liver initiative. And the need for in vitro liver models is that um, our in vivo models, our in vivo animal models don't always tell us the true picture of what's going on or what's going to happen once we take a compound from our in vitro models to, of course, animal models. And because of that, there's this gap in the liver in vitro space for better or predictive um, in vitro models. If we had a model that allowed us to jump ahead and not have to go through so many steps of animal studies and better predict what's going to happen, we can earlier on in drug this predict that a drug is going to fail and kill it and not waste a whole lot of money pushing it forward into animal studies needlessly. So there's a big gap today. I won't go through these charts in a whole lot of detail here, but there's a big gap today of predicting what's going to happen in vivo um, during in vitro assays. and. 3D cell culture models compared to their counterparts, 2D cell culture models provide a lot of benefits, um, both in the spatial context, but then also in the fact they facilitate a lot of um, formation of um, morphologies that we don't see in 2D, like biocaniculi. Um, we don't see the complex phenotypes in 2D that we see in 3D. And we're better able to mimic in 3D what's actually happening in vivo compared to traditional 2D adherent um, cell culture systems. Now, the open liver that uh, model that we've developed um, is comprised of a couple different components. Um, so you see here we have our hepatocytes. These can be HEPA-RGs. They can be primary human hepatocytes. Uh, we have our liver sinusoidal endothelial cells, our cuffer cells, our cellulite cells. Uh, we have glangiocytes and a number of other uh, key components of our um, liver models here. And we designed this model to have similar um, uh, composition to actual in vivo uh, liver tissue. And you see on the bottom here, these images, these are all done using our CX-7. We're able to look at the, the composition of these models using um, our imaging-based approach. And a lot of the work that we're doing, we're generating these models um, ultra low attachment um, U-bottom uh, plates. We're able to generate these models pretty easily using that construct. Now, um, other features of this model, uh, we can go glycogen storage, transporter approach, we have our SIPs that are functional. Um, and this model, we're able to characterize both from a compositional standpoint and then also a functional standpoint to show that it is actually mimicking what we're seeing in vivo. And we can look at um, a bunch of different types of assays using this model. So we can take um, really simple assays like drug-induced liver injury. We can acetaminophen, which is always your, your standard go-to, and look at increasing concentrations of acetaminophen, and we start to see our mitochondrial health um, um, get worse over time, and our viability, of course, is getting worse over time as well. So we can multiplex a couple different other markers to this assay, so apoptosis, if it's applicable, we can look at cell proliferation. We're able to look at many different markers at the same time um, using this assay approach and using these models. Um, another one is um, and we can look at uh, indirect and mediated uh, response here. So we can look at viability. Look at with and without um, LPS. And we can see the difference between those two um, amendments here. And again, in this case, using high content imaging again with the CX-7 uh, LZR system. And we're able to get a lot of imaging-based endpoints from these models. But I would say that these endpoints aren't, um, you know, they aren't becoming of imaging. There's a lot of folks that are doing similar endpoints without imaging. The reason that we here at Visicol rely upon imaging for a lot of our endpoints is that we're able to start multiplexing endpoints to answer multiple questions at the same time. If you're looking at just viability, you can use a dissolution-based ATP assay, which is uh, really Uh, models. But as we look at diseases like NASH and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we're starting to look at really complex phenotypes that are tough to characterize using simple plate reader assays or simple um, wide field imaging assays, where it starts to lend itself to high content imaging, and especially confocal analysis. During the NASH cascade, we're looking at fibrosis, we're looking at collagen deposition. These are features and phenotypes that are really challenging to characterize with a lot of the traditional assays that are out there, where multiplex imaging and confocal imaging become particularly important. 
Um, so for something like steatosis, um, very simple part of the Nash cascade, this is not that complicated. This is an assay that we can do with very simple uh, 3D cell culture models. We can use hefty 2s we can use our open liver model. Um, but in this case, we're using a very simple imaging-based approach, and we're looking at just lipid accumulation. But for more complicated readouts, such like fibrosis, we're looking at collagen deposition throughout these models. Collagen deposition is something that we can't truly appreciate if we're looking at a 3D cell culture model in 2D or if we're doing a, um, a dissolution-based assay. It's something where we really need the ability to image these models uh, with confocal microscopy. Something that we employ at Visicol is tissue clearing. So we use tissue clearing, which allows us to uh, take our uh, high content and actually image the entire depth of these 3D cell culture models so we can look at collagen deposition throughout the depth of the model instead of just looking at the exterior. A problem always with imaging-based endpoints is that if you're only getting light to penetrate one, two, or three cell layers deep into one of these models, it really limits your ability to characterize the model in its entirety. We're ultimately switching from 2D to 3D because 3D allows us to have spatial context, but if we're not able to get photons into our models, we're not actually characterizing the entirety of the model. So we see with things like NASH, um, looking at immune cell infiltration, um, looking at spatial dose response curves, the detail and the spatial context of these models really matters. And unless you use tissue clearing, you're just not going to see it. You're only going to see the outside of the model and the outside few cell layers, which don't uh, depict the entire population of cells within your 3D cell culture model. So the example I'm just showing here is we're looking at one of these open liver models. Uh, we have our so nothing's really happening for um, collagen deposition. But if we look at TGF beta, so we're stimulating this NASH cascade, we start to see a whole lot of cell death. We start to see a whole lot of uh, collagen deposition, where if we take our other control here, which is our um, beta stimulation, our ALK5 inhibitor, and we're ameliorating that collagen deposition to some degree. We're seeing less cell death. And we're actually seeing that NASH cascade reversed to some degree here, or ameliorated at the very uh, least. And this is something, again, that you couldn't really appreciate without imaging. Um, so in this case, this NASH assay is totally dependent upon the ability to image these models in 3D, to use tissue clean. Um, and also a really reproducible and robust system. Something that we've run into a lot with some of our other imagers is for assays like this, where we're imaging uh, models over extended period of time, that imager cannot go down. It cannot break. It cannot have a problem. We have to have that imager up and running all the time, especially for a business like ours, where we're doing contract research for pharma companies and timing is essential. Um, so again, this assay just speaks volumes to the importance of um, high content imaging, tissue clearing, and also the capability um, that we have with the CX-7 of using lasers for excitation. Lasers allow us to actually get much better depth than LEDs in a lot of cases. And um, this really allows us to get this um, assay with a really strong assay window and be able to provide our clients with a NASH assay that meets a truly unmet need today. Now with that, I will um, I'll wrap. I think uh, one of the last comments I want to have was that uh, you know, overall, we've been super happy with our, our CX-7 system, and we've built out a lot of software over the last few years to stack on top of that system. Um, but I know, and I'm sure Sesh has talked about this a number of times, each individual on the phone, but they've built out a great suite of software on top of the CX-7, especially as new applications and 3D cell culture becomes more pertinent. And those have been very helpful. And I'm sure Sesh has dived into that in a lot of detail um, with all of you. But overall, we've just been super happy with our CX-7 system to date. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. Really appreciate it. Um, there are a few questions on the from the attendees. Um, I think let me read them out to you. Okay. Um, I think one of the questions is from Kalina, and she asks, mm, do you use U-bottom plates for your um, spheroids, I guess, right? I mean, it doesn't specify spheroids, but Kalina, I'm assuming it's uh, for the spheroids, the liver spheroids. I I um I can answer that. So we use um we use the ultra low attachment plates for. 3D cell culture work that we do. They just allow for very easy aggregation. Uh, one of the challenges we have seen is with some. 
don't use lasers. There's a bit of a challenge with actually focusing at the bottom of those and getting good imaging data. And with LEDs in particular, with the U-bottom plates, you will have some image artifacts. You'll have this weird like, halo effect around the bottom of the model that we've seen. Um, some of those factors can get subtracted out in uh, post-processing. Uh, but overall, with the lasers on our CX-7 LCR and with the um, U-bottom plates, we don't really have any issues with focusing or imaging. Oh, that's awesome. So you don't have to pretty much take it uh, from a U-bottom and transfer it to a flat bottom, right? That's the question that uh, she's we been trying to, to ask. That. Yeah, we us projects where they'll send us plates that are incompatible with imaging for one reason or another. And I mean, it's a nightmare. Anybody who's transferred steroids before knows how tedious it is. And all of a sudden for you know, an asset that should be high throughput, you're adding hours of processing time and you're losing steroids in the process. And it's it's a nightmare. There's not a good way to automate it. So yeah, we just do all of our processing and imaging right in those U-bottom plates. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Um, I'm not sure if there are any additional questions, but I have a few questions of my own. I hope you don't mind me asking. Um, I really, um, I'm curious about that code registration algorithm that you guys built. Um, particularly um, based on the DAPI channel, right? I think, are you saying that it uses the DAPI to, uh, as a fiduciary mark, right? Um, exactly. How far can you go? Because I, I'm starting to see a few um, of our scientist base um, trying to investigate in complex tissues like uh, like a brain slice, right? Um, but look for like 50 different markers, but so they might want to do it like six or seven times, right? Um, so is it, it does it lose its accuracy after a certain time or have you seen it be consistent across Let's say if you stack up six or seven slices. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're talking about actual serial section, right? No, uh, uh, the same section, wiping it out and then restaining it. Got it, got it. Um, so long as you're not damaging the epitopes, the tissue itself, the processing, you should be able to do it theoretically indefinitely. However, what we've seen that happens is you will start to degrade the proteins during the process. With ours, we've done five, six rounds of real issue okay uh, depending upon how they're fixed and how they're processed uh, but so long as the tissue isn't shrinking or expanding dramatically as you're processing it it really shouldn't be that much of an issue um, but then again, one of the other issues that you'll see is by that fourth round or that fifth round, the tissue becomes more porous and the signal intensity will actually increase. So as you get, if you were to label the same marker five times in a row, the fourth time or fifth time, you might have a higher signal intensity than the first time. So there's some other factors at play, but those, the DAPI signals, they should be in the exact same spot almost every time. And if not, that algorithm is stretching the, um, the image dynamically to put them back together. Um, so I would say as long as you're preserving the tissue, you shouldn't really have any issues with that, even six or seven times through. Okay, that's uh, that's fantastic. I'd love to put it to use at uh, at some point. Um, any uh, any thoughts about 3D analysis? I don't know whether you were there at Nick uh, Nick Radio's talk yesterday, but he highlighted the utility of Amira, uh, which is our 3D volumetric software that's uh, that's built specifically for the CX7 workflow, right? Um, I I see a true value in uh, in utilizing something like this alongside with Amira, so that uh, you could address um, the analysis piece in a three dimensional space, right? Have you ever thought of uh, thought of that or uh, any comments on that? Sure. So we we got in this space um, about four or five years ago, and initially we built out a huge suite of software for our own internal use. So not, not a lot of software existed at the time, and those that did were pretty expensive and not that extensive. So we built out a lot of software, and I would say a lot of software that we've built is actually inherent in the software that Nick had talked about. Um, so I would say we kind of the ball. I wish we didn't have to spend three years building our own software. Um, the software that you guys have does answer a lot of the questions um, that we get asked by our researchers today. Uh, it just didn't exist when we originally had launched our services. But I would say, yeah, those spatial questions, um, you know, like to be answered in that software. And sometimes it's just it's trying to come up with clever solutions on how to answer research questions. Something as simple as collagen deposition. 
measure? Do you measure with intensity, with volume, a combination thereof? Um, you know, of course, algae on the outside of a cell or outside of a model will be more intense than that on the inside, um, even if they're the same quantity or volume. So I think there's some complicated questions behind a lot of the research questions. But that software definitely lends itself to be being able to be used to answer those questions. I just wish it existed a few years ago. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, it's still worth a shot. I think we can have an offline conversation about how we can uh, help you with the Avira software uh, to see if there is some cross comparisons there, right? So. Excellent, excellent. That's awesome, Michael. I uh, I really appreciate this. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if there are any additional questions from the panelists, from uh, the attendees. Um, if not, uh, this was really nice. Uh, it's, it shows the versatility of the CX-7 platform uh, for not just imaging, which we knew that it was capable of, but to see the volume of stuff that you showed on tissue imaging. I hope uh, our attendees and the, our user base benefit out of that. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's very valuable information. Um, one more question. I think Johnny Wang uh, has a, a question. I'm, I'm just going to read out. Uh, can you do serial staining tech for 3D organoid? I don't know what that means, but uh, uh, I use uh, Johnny. Can you elaborate a little more on that on your uh, comment box? Um, are you saying um, serial staining of 3D organoids? Is that is that what you're referring to, Michael? Uh, can you see the qu the question that was on the right side? I'm just looking at it. Sorry, I'm scrolling through that now. Um, so I'm trying to find it over here. Sorry, Johnny. He's asking, can you repeat staining for 3D model? Oh, I see what he means. Yeah. Yeah, so you're, you're um, referring to multiple rounds of labeling for one model. It's something um, we have tried a little bit, um, but I would say we haven't extensively done. It would be very cool um, to wash out the labels and come back in. Some 3D cell culture models that were, is getting labels in is very challenging. I would imagine getting them out and then back in would be further challenging. Um, some models like neuronal organoids are really hard to get labels to penetrate. I mean, it could take you a week to get your label to penetrate 50 or 100 microns into it. Um, so I would bet it's feasible. It just might be incredibly time intensive to do. And by time intensive, I just mean it might take a long period of time. Label, wash out, and relabel again. I know um, uh, imaging mass cytometry, people have gone up to 40 labels with uh, a single organoid, but again, that's really expensive to do. Um, so I would say theoretically it's probably possible, we just don't have a lot of experience with it. I hope that uh, answers your question, Johnny. Um, Hi, Michael, uh, this is Fred Stanstead. I wanted to thank you for uh, such a great talk. Uh, one of the questions I had was uh, on the thickness of the tissues that you're imaging with the CX7 LDR. Um, what sort of uh, distance and spread in the uh, tissues have you seen? Yeah, the, um, the 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 largest depth that we've ever done is on one of the Matec uh, full thickness epiderm models. Um, it's about a millimeter in thickness. That's the deepest we've ever gone. Um, practically, I would say most of what we're doing is 500 microns or less. Without 500 microns, you start to get all sorts of problems with refracted index mismatch. Um, and we've tried um, using dipping objectives on other systems, but with tissue clearing, uh, the dipping objectives don't actually provide that much value. Without tissue clearing, they do, but I would say five or so is the sweet spot. Um, it's also label dependent. Some antibody labels just will not go that deep. So usually we're about 500 microns to 1,000 microns is the uh, sweet spot. So in that range, you can do like whole out retinas. You can do one to your mouse brain sections. Um, but beyond that, I would say you really don't get good data. Even towards 1,000, the quality and the intensity starts to decline quite a bit. Thank you.